my paper, I tried to deep in the topic of what I presented regarding presbyterium ordinis, that theme of priestly identity. That, and if we remember, we tried to describe that there were some tensions and that the big issue was what is the authentic priestly identity. So I wanted to share just the part that in some way it's a new addition to what I presented. And I think that for me it was, was, was important to get back to this time. So I would like to share like first, what was Jesus' identity? Then what was the identity of the disciples? I don't know if it's your experience in ministry right now, but I'm convinced that that's the most important question right now, at least for college students. Maybe mm -hmm. a couple of years ago it was, what is the purpose of life? What is the meaning? But today, mm -hmm. the big question is, who am I? Wow. And actually, um, there is a series that is pretty cool that is called um, uh, Search. The Search from Chris Stefanik. And the first question is, who am I? And before asking like what I am for, like what is the meaning of life? And I think it's very important for us and but for the world and even more for our priestly ministry. So I would like to draw the attention first to Jesus' identity. This image, of course, is from his temptations at the desert, but I really like it because we know that he spent time in prayer. And a few years ago, I had the chance to study like Jesus' identity in the Gospel of John. And I won't share that whole research, but just to I want to highlight that the Gospel of John is amazing how it describes that Jesus' identity was vertical. It came from the Father. And because if we ask what is our identity, we could have different answers. This is something I construct, it's something I build, it's something that the culture tells me, it's something that comes from beneath. But Jesus, in Jesus' life is very clear, and the logic is that if we understand Jesus' identity, we will understand the priest's identity, is that mainly it comes from above, from his relationship with the Father. And just to, to share some aspects in, in the Gospel of John, we won't read all this, but just to, in, in the Gospel of John, it's very clear that Jesus' identity, I, and here I share just four, I think, mm -hmm. elements of his identity, for awareness comes from the Father. His awareness of being loved, his awareness of having been sent by the Father, his awareness of returning to the Father, his awareness of living in his presence. Mm. So for example, just I will read one of, of each. His awareness of being loved, the Gospel of John says, for the, the Father loved his Son, shows him everything that he himself does. I think this is very important for a priestly identity. Like, the awareness of being loved by the Father, so I, I don't need to seek love, but I am able to give love. The second dimension, the awareness of having been sent, well, this is very clear in the Gospel of John. But for example, uh, John 17, 3, that they should know you, the one true God, and the one who you sent, Jesus Christ. Jesus has a great idea, a great conviction that he been, has been sent. The awareness of returning to the Father. So identity is not only to know where I'm coming from, but where I'm, I'm heading. And for example, John 13, 1 is amazing. Before the Feast of Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to pass from this world to the Father. It's amazing what, what a freedom gives to Jesus to know that his, his death, as Cantalamesa says, is a passing to the Father. And finally, an awareness of living in his presence. I am not alone, but it is I and the Father who sent me. This can become really practical when we think of the difference of when you are facing a challenge in our ministry to know that you are loved, that you have been sent, that you are going to the Father. Well, this was very clear in the life of Jesus. Further on, and I think it's important, we see how Jesus tried to transmit a clear identity to his disciples. And some, I would like just to, to share some passages. The first one is how he called them. He says, in these days he went out to the mountain to pray and 
all night he continued prayer to God. And it was day, when it was day, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve whom he named apostles. It's an amazing thing that we, we read this passage many times, but something I, I, I meditate this week, I, I pray with this gospel, is that what that must have looked like, no? Like so it says that he called the multitude and he started calling. That's that must have been like an exciting moment, like knowing that you're being called by him. And we know that he was with multitudes, with multitudes during the day, but at sunset, only those that had been called to him, with him, would stay with him. It's an amazing thing. The how, and, and, and the identity that that must have stayed with, uh, I mean, the identity that must have start growing in them no? that they were not just part of the multitude but they would stay with them the second quote is Mark 3.14 and I like really this one because it connects this tension that we have been speaking about persuasion of ordinance Mark 3.14 he says he appointed 12 to be with him and to be sent out so these two dimensions uh, like the some way the vertical dimension and the one horizontal dimension Pope Benedict once in the in the, the year of priesthood gave a great homily commenting this passage. And he says, historically there was a temptation to associate the contemplative life just with this part, to be with him, and the active ministry to be sent out. But he says that that's a false opposition. Only the one that is with him can be sent out, and when you are really sent out, you go back to him. Mm. And But this verse, is it, it's amazing, and I think it really and we will see, and we know the Gospels that, and Acts of the Apostles and Paul, and I will see that, that they had a clear conviction of how these two were connected. Following more, uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, there's a passage that I really like because the commentator says that there were three big temptations of, of the enemy. So after Pentecost, there's, this commentator says that the church experienced three big temptations. One, persecution, that was very obvious. The second one was like moral challenges, the case of Ananiah and, and Sapphira. And the third one was destruction from their identity. And this is the passage when, remember that issue of the widows, they had to resolve the issue of how to take care of the widows. And it's an amazing moment because they are tempted as Jesus was in the desert in their identity. What will we do? Will we like lose our energy and dedicate ourselves to serve the tables? Or we will make a decision to protect our identity? And, and for me, this is an amazing moment in the history of, of the early community. I, won't, I will not read it all, but they decide that they need to protect, as I says, we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the world. This is a great example of a decision made in order to protect an identity. It was very good to serve the tables, and someone needed to do that. But the apostles, as they, they, they knew that they were chosen to be with him and be sent, they would say, okay, let's, and that's the, the beginnings of the diaconate. They, they decided to choose, choose deacons, and they will be dedicated to that. For me, it's an amazing example of, of that. And finally, we, further on, we see it in Paul, all the first verses of all his letters show his identity. For example, this one, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. <laughs> Imagine you receive a letter from Paul and he starts like this, like, <laughs> you will listen to him. So the point I'm trying to share is how Jesus had a great identity and the disciples, the first priest had a, a great identity that was mainly vertical and that it would in some way be clear what their first mission, to be in prayer and to announce the gospel. And, and I think that with good intention, the, as, we, as we share, the council try to maintain this. We, we, we have seen the, the tensions. So, Finally, I want to share two aspects that I, I describe in my paper. 
that if we would, another way of referring to identity is to, that it's, another way to put it is that identity is human and spiritual maturity. What does it look like and in, uh, in our formation and in continuum? So here I quote, um, I would say an expert in religious life that is called Father Amadeo Sensini, that he's a consultant for the, the congregations from, for religious life. I also had the chance of studying some of his words. And here's a passage that I like. He says, if the choice to consecrate oneself to God has to be free and responsible, formation must be directed toward the whole person. Its complexity is to be coaxed into converging towards a single end, the maturation of the person believing consecrated into one, without artificial divisions or watertight compartments, without dividing the journey into rigid several steps one after the other. I think this puts in maybe using some psychological categories, something that it was in the spirit of the council and of presbyterian ordinance, the, the unity of life, the importance of maturing. And I like this expression that when all our life converges to a center, that means to be mature. And there's no, as he says, watertight compartments, different things. And we seen, we, we saw in the tension of the ontological uh, model and the social model that there was a tendency to, in some way, to live in compartments. One thing is how I celebrate, but another thing is my connection with people, or the other way around. The important thing is just to connect with others, and that does not affect so much my prayer life, or who I am, or my consecration. So I think uh, this is a good way to put it. Identity looks like, so in other categories, it means human and spiritual maturity. To refer all what I live to a center and to discern from a center and to make decisions toward that. Lastly, um, I like also this author that speaks about the, how identity is something objective but also subjective. So it's, it's true, once we were ordained, we receive an objective identity, but it needs to become subjective. And for example, here I share a passage where he, his model is to present the sentiments of the sun as, as, as the model. And he says, for as long as one does not feel freely attracted by the beauty of Christ and of being like him, there is no talking about priestly formation. The aim of formation, in fact, is to propose a precise model, a form constituting the new identity of the consecrated person. And that such be felt by him, this is very important. It's not that just is proposed, but felt by the person. If such a form are the sentiments of Christ, then it is a question of forming in the freedom of letting oneself be attracted by the mysterious beauty of the sun in order to be oneself. For this reason, and he used this expression that is particularly from him, as long as the mystical chromosome is absent, one is still not in formation, but a dependent who carries out orders with little conviction and will passion. Although he's thinking for, foremost in form, priestly formation, I think it, it applies to priestly identity because they are very connected. So I, I like that what he suggests is that our continual formation, and I thought it to myself in my ongoing formation, this new identity, it, it, it implies like an active and daily appropriation. It's not something like, okay, I had this identity before and now not, but it demands like an ongoing identity. <laughs> and what is good is that if we are aiming to an interior configuration, that implies in some way being attractive. He, he says in our part of his book, it's not enough that we may discover that priesthood is true, good, and beautiful in itself. We need to discover that it's true, good, and beautiful for me. That's the, the main thing. It's not to oppose, it's not just something relativistic, but to make it my own. This expression is very unique from him, but basically we would say that 
as long that there is no fire in the heart, we will experience what our priestly ministry implies as something exterior. And we won't have conviction and we won't have passion. When we discover that all what implies our identity reflects and expresses who we are, then we will be freely choosing wherever we are. If nobody's looking at us, we will just because we are living in the eyes of the Father with conviction and with passion. Okay, this is what I wanted to, to share. The rest is really similar is to take this to what I have shared with you about the two models and the tension and uh, about the council. Excellent. Excellent.